Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to once again talk about one of the most fascinating organisms on the planet, the slime mold. The organism you see right here, in this case, this would be the representative known as Fissarium polycephalum. Now we've talked a lot about slime molds in one of the previous videos that should be popping up somewhere right there, but today we're actually discussing a really interesting experiment and a really interesting proposition that goes in a slightly different direction and explains the idea of loners. Why is it that some people, some animals and some species out there prefer to be alone? Even in species that are generally social, like humans. In other words, why do loners exist and does it have any benefits to the species as a whole? And as the recent study discovered, it turns out the answer is yes. Loners actually help the survival of the species. But we'll talk more about this in a little bit more detail once I remind you a little bit more about this right here. Mostly because this particular study actually deals with slime molds. You might have heard of slime molds before, but essentially it's an organism that we believe to be a fungi for a very long time. Turns out they're not. They're actually in this miscellaneous group. The group that's not animals, not plants, and not fungi. The large group known as Protista. And generally speaking, slime molds are an exceptionally interesting organism. First of all, They've been used in a lot of different studies to discover that they seem to possess some sort of a simple intelligence. They're able to solve mathematical problems. They also seem to possess the ability to sense the environment around themselves without possessing any organs to do so, something we usually refer to as mechanoreception. And they also seem to possess the ability to remember. They seem to have memory. Now, all of this was discussed in that previous video, but in a nutshell, these are fascinating organisms. Right now, they're even on the International Space Station in order to see what sort of behavior they exhibit if you put them in zero-g conditions. But one thing that is really important for this particular video and for this particular study is to remember what slime mold actually is. It's a collection of individual cells that come together in order to create a single, extremely large cell that's able to perform a lot of different complex tasks. And that's also able to do a lot of things that a single organism cannot do. In other words, it's when a lot of organisms combine into one, creating something so much bigger as a result. In some sense, I guess you can think of it as a herd of animals that has a much higher chance of survival than a single animal in the middle of savanna. But here's the thing though. We know that generally animals that are social have a higher chance of survival if they stay as a group. But pretty much all of those social animals, including us, tend to have the idea of loners. You know, an individual somewhere out there that doesn't actually like being part of the group. And that can be for one reason or another, the actual reason is not important. The important thing here is that they seem to exist across pretty much most of the species, if not all of the species. So for example, for humans, we have a lot of different ways of describing a loner. But even animals like wildebeest, during a major migration of the species, when hundreds, if not thousands of animals travel all together into a new direction, will always have a small group of animals that stays behind and does not follow the crowd, doesn't actually follow the herd. So maybe not entirely loners, but definitely animals that prefer to stick around to a smaller group. Although in some cases, even just a single beast can be left behind. And something extremely similar happens in a lot of different species of social insects. For example, when it comes to the swarm of locusts that are known to create swarms of billions and even trillions of insects, there are always one or two or just a few left behind that after becoming a locust, revert back to their grasshopper behavior and remain where they started. Essentially, they don't actually leave with the rest of the swarm. An interestingly similar behavior has also been observed in plants. For example, in bamboo forests, there's always at least one or two bamboo trees that will produce flowers either before or after the rest of the trees. In some cases, possibly even months before or months after. And something similar has always been observed in slime as well. So the researcher behind the paper you can find in the description below has always been fascinated with this really unusual observation coming from slime mold. So as I mentioned before, generally what we're seeing right here is essentially a collective of different tiny amoeba cells that become a much larger organism that starts to exhibit a lot of complex patterns. And eventually some of these species of slime mold even start forming these fungi-like formations with some of the spores right here that sort of sit on top and wait for something to pick them up and to transfer them to a different system where there might be food available for them. But during that time, a lot of other amoeba cells that were present in the mold 
essentially have to sacrifice themselves for the better good of the rest of the cells. So here's for example what happens in most species of slime mold. You'll notice that a lot of these smaller amoebas start to congregate and create a single large formation, which usually happens when the conditions are no longer habitable, when things become too dry or maybe too cold and there's no more food available. This type of a congregating behavior is basically a way for this slime mold to survive. When the conditions are good, slime mold tend to be alone and tend to just move around and consume all of the nutrients around. But once things start to become difficult, they'll slowly start to create a single piece. Notice how they sort of just combine into this one large chunk, which then starts to move around and also exhibits a lot of other complexity. But in every single case, when they were studying slime mold, they were discovering the same pattern. At least a third of the amoeba were left behind as loners, as single organisms. They were not all combining creating this large chunk. Some of them remain behind. So what causes this blob to form and why is it that some of them are left behind? So here are actually the loners that are left. Now originally the explanation was that they served no purpose whatsoever. They were believed to be a mistake and something that is just left behind because obviously here things happen really fast. And so even though most of them will end up creating this formation, the loners that are left behind are there probably by mistake. At least that was the sentiment up until this recent paper where the scientist was just not happy with this answer. They were not happy with the definition of a loner being some sort of a mistake or some sort of an error. And so first of all they tested them. They took some of these loners and wanted to find out if they were just flawed and were unable to reproduce. But turns out there was nothing wrong with them. Once you were to give them the ability to have food and to procreate, they would divide creating offspring that was totally normal and would then once again create similar formations, creating everything that a normal slime would do as well. And so even though these loners themselves were not actually responding to the same conditions the same way a normal slime would, all of their progeny did exactly the same thing, with some forming larger structures or larger slime mold, others remaining as more loners. As a matter of fact, exactly the same amount of loners, approximately one third. And they were able to see these patterns over and over and over again, as if this was something normal. There was always that one third of all of the cells that tended to be out of sync with the rest of the population. Once again, something that's also observed in a lot of other collective systems, in other species, in a lot of other animals, and of course, in a lot of plants as well. And so it looks like it's not a mistake at all. It looks like this is actually a strategy that a lot of organisms, a lot of social organisms use for survival. But the question is, how does it work? Well, first, let's try to understand what actually happens with these organisms in order to even create these social colonies. So as I mentioned before, normally these organisms live alone. They are single cells. But once the conditions deteriorate and become too hostile, they start to congregate forming an extremely large and very complex structure. Structure that's technically still a single cell, but it's also extremely complex and is able to perform a lot of different things. If the conditions become too hostile and too extreme, they will then start forming these very large swaying towers that start to grow higher and higher up. And depending on the slime mode, they also look somewhat different, but generally resemble a mushroom. Which is exactly why it was believed to be a fungi for an extremely long time. This is not a fungi. This is literally a single cell. And the point of this structure is to basically have something pass by right here, for example some sort of an insect such as a fly, in order to hitch a ride to another location. But this particular structure pretty much guarantees that only the top survivors will actually get to live. Because this is a congregation of billions of different cells, a lot of these other cells inside this one large mega cell pretty much end up sacrificing themselves for the collective good of those few survivors. But this collective system seems to have another insurance plan in mind. A sort of an evolutionary insurance plan, if you will. By leaving behind some of these loner cells, first of all this allows the leftover cells to take advantage of any resources that might still be around when the conditions improve. Which is a super interesting strategy in allowing the collective to survive. If every one of the cells were to create the slime mold that would then get taken by insects to different locations, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that any of them would survive. As a matter of fact, if the location they're taken to is also inhospitable, it will pretty much guarantee that the entire species is going to eventually perish. But if you were to leave behind just a few cells and to have them stay in the same location where they used to live that used to be habitable, 
At least statistically speaking, it actually guarantees that at least someone is going to survive. And in this case, the scientists even tested how the numbers of lunars differed. The actual number of lunars is not actually constant. It does seem to depend on the density of the population. So, for example, if the initial number of cells was relatively low, roughly around 30% of all of the cells are going to be left behind. Yet, if the initial number was much higher, the total percentage goes down dramatically, leaving behind a slightly higher number of cells, but much lower percentage. Which actually indicates that all of this is a result of almost like a communication between cells. The decision to become a loner is essentially a collective decision. It's not a decision of the organism itself. And we're not talking about actual communication. It's almost like a non-verbal cue communication. If there's a huge number of the same members of the species doing something very similar to each other, there's going to be a tiny number left behind that's going to be extremely different. And all of this is done only to preserve the species, without the loners obviously realizing what they're doing. So essentially here, by going against the flow, they allow the entire collective to become invulnerable to whatever dangers they might face if they were to become this, and if all of them were to perish completely. Becoming invulnerable to any collective dangers that might lie ahead. But their offspring does exactly the same thing. Some of them will become social, some of them will remain lonely. Making loners an important part of the evolutionary strategy for the survival of various species. But this is, for now at least, a hypothesis. There's almost no way to actually physically prove this. And even though the paper itself is really, really good at explaining this, and to some extent I would even call this brilliant, it's still not a theory and not a conclusive result. We need to have more studies to try to figure out what's really happening here. And more importantly, how exactly does this all work? It obviously works differently for every species, but it's still an important strategy that a lot of species seem to employ. Anyway, for now that's all I wanted to mention. As always, check out the study in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.